OK, so the basic idea is that we've put software prefetching into the compiler. I'm sure there's plenty of you in the room who have tried to use software prefetching. I'm sure there's many of you for whom it did not work. It's surprisingly difficult to get software prefetchers right when you're writing them by hand. Though it turns out that the ways in which you can write good software prefetching is uh, very consistent across different workloads, different microarchitectures. So you might as well actually put it in the compiler and let the compiler deal with it instead. OK, so the first thing we need to talk about if we're writing good software prefetchers is what should we actually software prefetch? Well, the first thing you might think of are stride accesses. Uh, where you've got regular access patterns such as uh, arrays or matrices. Well, there's no point in doing that because it's already covered by the hardware stride prefetcher. The hardware stride prefetcher has access to dynamic information. It should be able to do it a lot better than any software scheme. And also, you don't have to put the, all of these extra instructions into the program, which is going to slow the program down if you can do it in hardware. So there's no point in doing those. What about linked data structures then, such as linked lists or trees? Well, they aren't covered by the hardware, but there's still no point because there's no memory level parallelism there. You, to actually achieve good prefetching, you need to be over to, able to overlap lots of memory accesses. And you can't do that with linked structures because you don't know uh, multiple iterations into the future what you're going to access. How about indirect memory accesses? Well, you'd hope that you can actually software prefetch these, given it is the title of the talk. And indeed, it is true. Uh, so these suffer from neither of the problems of the other two, in that these kind of access patterns, the sort of thing you see with, say, indexing accesses or sparse matrices or hash tables, um, they're really easy to calculate what you're going to access in a few iterations time because you're just striding down a single array and using that to look up in something else. Um, but your hardware can't work that out because that's lots of information. Uh, you've got a base array that you need to work out. You need to work out that the data you're using in there is actually looking all around the memory. And that isn't going to create a pattern just in terms of addresses. Uh, so you can prefetch them in software, but not in hardware. OK, an example here is integer sort from NAS Parallel. We've got these two arrays here, A and B. B is accessed indirectly using the values of A, so our memory accesses are all over the place in B. So we can't use the hardware stride prefetcher for that. It's not going to pick it up. But we can software prefetch it very easily, because we can look ahead in A, generate the addresses that we are going to access a few iterations time, and do a prefetch for those instead. Right, so we insert a software prefetch that does that, just that, and we get 9% performance improvement. That's not really amazing. It's OK, but it's not ideal. However, if we also insert a software prefetch for the stride access, and we stagger all of those accesses so that we only ever access something that has been prefetched in the past, we get a lot better performance improvement. We get this 1.3x times. And this is even though there is a hardware stride prefetcher in this system. This is a uh, out-of-order superscalar Intel system at Haswell. So it's got a decent stride prefetcher in there. But for these kind of accesses, you still need to prefetch the stride access in software. We're not entirely sure why that is. Uh, we think it's something to do with the fact that the hardware stride prefetch gets confused when you're using software prefetches. So that gets you 30%, but that's assuming that all of the offsets are set correctly, and that's quite a strong assumption in and of itself, that we know exactly how far to look ahead in the accesses that we're doing. Neither too short so that we'd have to wait for the prefetch to finish before we do the load, nor too long so that the data leaves the cache before we actually use it. So if either of those two things are true, we get much smaller improvements, uh, a slowdown if the offset is too small, and only a mild performance improvement if the offset is too big. However, as it turns out, uh, we'll see later that the right size to set is very consistent across very different microarchitectures, different memory systems, and different, uh, different workloads. Right, so how do we insert instructions that do this well within the compiler? Obviously, we need to identify where we're going to insert these. We need to do safety analysis to make sure that we don't cause any new loads to happen that aren't correct and will cause a fault in the system. And then we need to schedule them. We need to work out how far we're going to look ahead in terms of doing our software prefetch for a future loop iteration. OK, so our identification stage, uh, again, uh, using the example of integer sort from the previous slide, we are going to look in the LLVM IR to find load instructions. 
And then we're going to try and trace backwards uh, using Dataflow to find both dependent loads and also a phi instruction, which is an induction variable. Because then we can uh, add on to the induction variable to find a value that we're going to use in a few iterations time and do the prefetch to that. So we insert, uh, we do that, we find this load here um, that we get the second load down in bold and we can then use that, we go back, see that it depends on another load, so it's probably an indirect axis that's going to miss and then we find the phi node there as well which uh, in this case is a induction variable so we can use that to insert our new software prefetch instructions. Right, one thing we've not talked about yet though is that this isn't always safe. A prefetch is always safe to do because the prefetch is just speculation. Uh, prefetches are allowed to fault. However, in this code, we're also inserting a real memory access, which is in the prefetch to B, we do a load from A. That's not allowed to fault if we want it to be a safe optimization. So we have to insert some conditional checks in there. Uh, but to do that, we need to work out how big A actually is. One way we can do that, which in this case is the fact that we can go back and find the allocation instruction. So we know how big A is, so we can work out whether it's going to fault or not just by putting a conditional in there. That's not always true. You, this is essentially a best effort thing. Sometimes what you can do instead is uh, look at the size of the loop and make sure that you don't prefetch past the end of the maximum size of the loop that you're doing because when you can guarantee that if that will be a real memory access in the original program, you're only adding memory accesses that you did before. You can cause a new fault, well, you can cause a fault to happen earlier than it did before, but you aren't adding in any new faults by doing that. Right, so the final thing is that we've had question marks in our look ahead offsets until this point. Theoretically, the maximum, the amount that you want to look ahead is very workload and machine dependent. It's a ratio of the memory latency and how quickly you move through the code. But that's an extremely difficult calculation to make, even if you know which microarchitecture you're running it on. Uh, it's also very easy to make errors in that measurement. But as it turns out, you basically don't need to do this. You can go with something a lot simpler um, that's just based on a constant where the intuition behind this formula is that essentially you do a prefetch to 64 loads ahead and then stagger all of the prefetches to the dependent loads within that. Um, so we look ahead 64 for our stride, then 32 for our stride indirect. If it were a stride indirect indirect, it would be plus 64, plus 48, then plus 24. So that we've always got 64 loads between we do our, when we do our final prefetch and when we actually access it so that you've got um, a good amount of look ahead distance between them. We'll look later as to why 64 is actually a good number to set for our constant value here. Right, so in terms of benchmarks results, we looked at a lot of different stuff. We looked at some graph workloads from Graph 500, um, HPC workloads, integer sort, and conjugate gradient from uh, NAS Parallel, uh, where conjugate gradient essentially does sparse matrix multiplication. Hash join from um, HPCC, which is a database workload, and random access, which accesses memory randomly based on a hash function. And we get pretty reasonable speed ups all around. So if we look up in the top left, that's a Haswell machine, that's a fairly large out of order superscalar, we get 1.3x average performance improvement. Uh, the interesting thing there is that actually, counterintuitively, the more complicated the benchmark, the better speed up you get. Hash join is the most complicated benchmark we've got here because we've got all of this hash code in there in each loop iteration. And counterintuitively, that means that the software prefetch works better. We think this is something to do with the reorder buffer being filled in all of these cases. And in simple benchmarks, that means you already have lots of loads in flight from instruction level parallelism. But as the benchmark gets complicated, that's not true. So software prefetching gets you a better performance improvement. The A57 on the top right gets much smaller performance improvements, uh, 1.1 times average. Um, that's interesting because it's less out of order superscalar than the Haswell is. Um, so you'd expect the prefetch performance to be a lot better. Uh, but there seems to be a bottleneck here, which is the, um, the 
TLB system, the page walking, you can only do one page walk at a time on the A57, whereas you can do multiple on Haswell. So that becomes the bottleneck, which is why you don't see that big performance improvements from software prefetching. Uh, this appears to be different for the newer versions of the out of order superscalar cortexes, but we don't have complete information on that yet. However, if we look down in the bottom two corners, we've got the in order A53 and the in order Xeon Phi. The performance improvements there are much, much, much bigger. If we look at Xeon Phi, we get up to uh, seven times performance improvement from our automated pass. Um, incidentally, in most of these cases, we get pretty close to the manual case, except from where the access pattern is too complicated to pick up at compile time. Um, for A53, we get an average of 2.3 times performance improvement from our automated scheme. And for Xeon Phi, we get an average of 2.7 times performance improvement. That's quite a lot of performance that's being left on the table here by not doing these software prefetches. But you should expect this to be the case. Um, you can't overlap all of these memory accesses just using the hardware itself on an in-order in system. Uh, whereas you can if you insert these software prefetches because that doesn't violate the in-order nature of the processor. Okay, so I mentioned earlier that we've got this case where our microarchitectural constant for setting look ahead always seems to be 64. So we've got some graphs here for four of the benchmarks that we've looked at. And for all of the systems we looked at, 64 seems to be about right. Uh, it's not only that this works well, it's almost optimal for all of the benchmarks and systems that we looked at. This is even despite the fact that, say, our Xeon Phi uses GDDR5, uh, Haswell DDR3, uh, A57, uh, LPDDR4, and I think the A53 used uh, LPDDR3. Um, you'd expect this to be more different than it is. Um, but we think the intuition behind this is that actually the look-ahead distance ends up being based almost entirely on a ratio of memory latency divided by memory latency. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the intuition behind this is that uh, it should be a ratio of memory latency divided by compute time. But if your workload is very memory bound, the compute time is itself dominated by memory latency which is why this seems to be weirdly constant for all of, the, uh, all of the systems we've looked at. So essentially, you can do all of this in the compiler without having to do anything all that complicated, and you get really quite significant speed ups, especially on in-order systems. OK, well, thank you very much. Any questions? Uh, so we do do this on an out-of-order processor. Uh, the two on the top, Haswell and A57, are out of order. Um, uh, do, you, do you mean the hardware prefetcher? Uh, so the thing with the hardware prefetcher is that to be able to spot these patterns, you'd need to have a lot more information than you can reasonably get at runtime. Uh, it's the fact that if you look at the if we go back to our um, little diagram here, the memory accesses that we do are all over the place in terms of the address. So you wouldn't be able, not only would you not be able to learn the address pattern, there isn't a pattern in terms of addresses to learn. It's entirely data dependent. Uh, the instruction window on the hardware. Um, so we do it based on um, within function. Uh, we look within a um, within basic blocks and move outwards from the basic block until we either find an induction variable or we're not in a loop anymore. J just to try and find something that you can parallelize the memory accesses based on. Uh, on spec, um, so not really because spec doesn't really feature these memory accesses very much. I mean, so you can you can actually do this yourself if you go on. If you look, this paper was in at CGO, and all of the code is available on GitHub. So you can use collective knowledge to install that and run it on any benchmark you like. Uh, we haven't really targeted spec CPU 2006 simply because the benchmarks in it don't seem to have irregular memory accesses or they don't have 
irregular memory accesses that aren't linked lists, or they feature data sizes that are very small and fit in the cache simply because of how old spec is. Uh, two questions. One, are you contributing this? Two, have you tried running the benchmark with multiple threads at the same time, and does that have any effect? Uh, so for the first question, uh, I'm not planning to contribute it myself, but the code is all available. And you can test the code out for yourself on GitHub. We, uh, you can literally just click. Uh, download it and click run essentially, and it will automatically make all of the graphs and everything for you based on your own system. Uh, so the code is available. We aren't planning to inline it with, uh, with uh, LVM ourselves though at the moment, I don't think. Um, for the second question, uh, which was, sorry, what was the second question again? Uh, threads. Oh, threads, right. So if you look in the paper which we had at CGO with the same name, we have some stuff where we've got multiple copies of the same benchmark running at the same time, and you still get the same speed ups you see here. Um, have you tried that on uh, predicated loops or here? Um, on predicated loops? Yes, because uh, your prefetches will have to be predicated as well, and then you may have like, a penalty or pause check in. Uh, right, yeah, so we haven't tried it on any predicated loops, because I don't think we've found any, any benchmarks. Um, one thing that you can do to get rid of those checks is, of course, move them out of the loop. We've not done that within our past, because it doesn't make much difference to performance, and it's easier to implement this way. Uh, actually, we use uh, conditional selects to do this, rather than ifs in our actual implementation. Um, the, the thing we see here is that it just doesn't make that much difference to performance to have these conditions in there rather than not. So we expect that in general it won't make much difference to performance, even if you have other conditionals within there as well. Uh, sorry, not prefetching things that you wouldn't otherwise. Oh. Right, yes, so what our pass does at the moment is that if that is true, it won't generate a software prefetch. You can clearly make it more complicated than that. Um, at that point, what you would do is you would either have to check the condition within the prefetch or just do it speculatively. Uh, doing the prefetch itself speculatively is totally fine. You might lose some performance from it, but otherwise it's fine, as long as you can make sure that any loads that you're doing are actually correct. Thank you.